Hello and welcome to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Systems Thinking webinar series sponsored by the MIT System Design and Management Program. My name is Lois Slavin and I'm the Communications Director for SDM. It gives us uh, great pleasure to introduce Professor Nicholas, Nicholas excuse me, Ashford, who will be speaking today on Transforming the Industrial State the ultimate complex system challenge. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat um, and send to everyone. And with that, we turn it over to Nick. Thank you, Lois. Um, today I'm going to be talking about work that we've done over the last 10 years in the publication of a new book by Yale University Press called Technology, Globalization, and Sustainable Development with the subtitle, Transforming the Industrial State, which of course is the subject of the webinar today. The book was written with uh, my PhD student, Ralph Hall, who is now a professor at Virginia Tech. And uh, this has been a long and difficult um, pathway to this work because of course we live in a very complex world. Uh, start by saying what exactly is the system that we're talking about. And the system is represented by this multicolored overhead. At the upper left you see that all industrial systems or industrializing systems have a number of industries and activities. <clears throat> Extraction industry for minerals, materials, and energy. Manufacturing, agriculture, transportation, energy, so-called service industry, housing, and information and communication technology. <clears throat> the, this is what the economists call the supply side of the economy. And on the demand side of the economy, the products and services are required or demanded by individuals, by industrial actors, and by the government themselves. The typical approach of classical economists is to argue that supply and demand ought to be in balance. We should have neither a surplus nor a deficit of the goods and services that we need. Now we'll come back to how well this model works in practice. But what we finally have come to realize is that the industrialized and industrializing system has created a number of challenges to sustainability. And that encompasses a number of factors. The first is that while there may be plenty of goods and services produced, for some, there is an inadequate supply of and access to essential goods and services. Translating that into plain English, it means some people do not have enough food, enough oil and fuel, not enough access to housing, and so a substantial amount of people in both industrialized and industrializing countries do not have an adequate supply of the things that the industrial state produces. And then there are a series of problems which are appropriately in green. These are the environmental safety and health problems, uh, toxic pollution, climate disruption, resource depletion, and biodiversity or ecosystem challenges. Uh, you would think that the only environmental problem today is climate disruption, but of course there are many other problems falling into the other three categories which are also related to the workings of the industrial state, notably toxic pollution and resource depletion. And the last item in that set of green sustainability challenges is environmental just injustice, which reflects the fact that poor people and poor nations have a disproportionately high level of problems in the environmental area. They are also often the last to be given attention to be cleaned up. And then finally, the, the third element of sustainability problems has to do with the fact that employment and jobs, which do not create sufficient purchasing power to give people the necessary goods and services, are now a major issue facing all industrialized economies. While I have certainly claimed to be an environmentalist and someone concerned with health and safety, the issue 
which is likely to dominate the next two decades is going to be jobs with purchasing power. Because if people do not have enough money to get the essential goods, it creates both political and economic instability. Now, we'll be addressing solutions to those problems throughout the rest of this talk. They fall into five categories. The first, which is on everybody's list, of course, is education and human resource development. Those two are not quite the same. Human resource development means we need to have enough physicists, enough engineers, enough economists to run the industrial state. And education reflects the fact that people in their election of public representatives and their um, pressing for certain policies have to be educated well enough to understand both the source of the problems and the nature of the solutions in order to really uh, be able to contribute to those solutions. So for the general population, education and human resource development is key. Industry, which very often has contributed to the uh, increase of the problems, of course, has also argued they are also part of the solution. And certainly technology-based enterprises are part of the solution. It's not clear, however, that the industry that caused the problem is going to be the industry that contributes to the solution at the end of the day. And before the economic meltdown, and I'll be talking a lot about that today, uh, the issue of government intervention and regulation has been put on the back burner. People are now beginning to realize that government regulation, certainly of the financial institutions, but also of global climate change, health, safety, and environment, and labor markets, once more turns out to be a very, very major uh, issue in the United States in the election campaign, which is warming up. We find one political part arguing that regulation has been the problem and cannot be the solution, and the other political party arguing that we need government programs and regulation. And um, I will hope to persuade you that the latter perspective has more going for it than the former. Stakeholders have trusted neither the government in the past nor industry, and so they are increasingly involved. The most recent example being the Wall Street protests where people want to have their voices heard with regard to the insufficiency of policy responses. And then finally, a set of solutions, which is if you are going to transform the industrial state, there has to be financing of those efforts and the question about where they're going to come from. So this is the, essentially the picture of the system. And while, you know, on a smaller scale, people talk about the manufacturing system or the transportation system or the energy system, this is the mother of all systems. This is the system of the state, uh, which needs to be addressed in terms of coordinating policies. Now, to this overhead, I will add a couple other uh, additions, and one is that while it has been assumed that supply and demand are independent factors, in fact, Kenneth Galbraith, the Canadian economist and economic advisor to both Kennedy and Johnson, was quick to point out that actually we don't grow up necessarily wanting the things which the private sector produces, but there is an enormous uh, producer-created demand through advertising and other kinds of influence, which mean that the consumption is not an independent factor of the people who actually produce the goods and services. So producer-created demand is one way in which markets can be influenced, for good or for bad. <coughs> Secondly, the whole issue of finance and people involved in finance activities has greatly influenced the working of the market. There is the, the traditional appreciation that subsidies, for example, oil subsidies, food subsidies, and subsidies to production distorts the market. And then the realization since the 2008 meltdown that giving credit for both production expansion and for individual consumers to buy more than they could possibly pay back has created an enormous crisis and from home ownership to uh, energy. And this uh, has occurred because uh, 
government was not watching the store, and banks were leveraging their lending capabilities far beyond the traditional factor of six, and individuals were encouraged to buy things which they probably would never be able to pay back. And so the system has been influenced and gamed, and now the question is, we are here now in 2011, what do we do about that problem? Probably useful to ask uh, what the major uh, system problems are and what their origins are, and they are numbers, a, numer a set of numerous uh, problems. One is the fragmentation of the knowledge base and the resulting inadequate solutions. We educate people differently in engineering and in science and in law and economics. Um, we educate people as sociologists who are not educated in technology and technologists who are not educated in human behavior. And we end up not only in the universities, but we end up in the government separating departments of industry, departments of commerce from departments of environmental protection, from human resource development. And in the industrial firm, we have the divisions of product development, divisions of marketing, divisions of environmental compliance. This balkanization of the knowledge base continues to plague us so that the solutions that we, we, we suggest and work on, for example, such as biofuels, which might make us energy independent, but which have an enormous air pollution deficit and bid up the price of land so that food is extraordinarily expensive, is simply a reflection that we're only working on part of the problem. We also have an inequality of access to economic and political power, which is um, uh, reflected by the fact that we have the petroleum industry and the energy industry dictating our energy policy and uh, the chemical industry arguing that we do, should not regulate greenhouse gases and ozone. We also have, because we are an aging industrial systems, and we have many in the aging industrial systems, a tendency towards a term I coined called gerontocracy, which means governance by the old, which leads to a major defect in the problem, which is both technological lock-in and political lock-in. We are stuck in ways of doing things which continue to continue to have bad outcomes. And this lock-in is usually, but not always, accompanied by concentration of economic and political power. The economists among us would first be quick to mention that we have market imperfections. We do not internalize the cost of production, so we have an inadequate pricing. Energy is underpriced. Goods are underpriced. And uh, they do not incorporate the cost that we really uh, suffer. But even perfectly working markets have their limitations because uh, things occur in different time frames. We have to spend money now in order to get benefits later. And because of the problem of discounting, uh, one can argue, and in fact, the criticism of the Stern report on global warming argued it just wasn't worth um, controlling global warming, which occurred much, much later. There's also a delay in recognizing problems which, whose work through the limits of growth was pioneered by Jay Forrester here with the system dynamics group, which indicated that by the time you realize that certain problems occur, you will have reached the tipping point and it either becomes very expensive or impossible to reverse that. And of course, we're seeing a tipping point with the cards to global warming, global climate change, the melting of the glaciers. And we also have tipping points with regard to the extent to which water supplies are compromised by pollution. Once you put a toxic material in a water system, it is virtually impossible to remove it. And so this limits the growth, which has been uh, initially ignored and poo-pooed even by MIT economists, have finally come to its day where people realize we have reached the limits to growth. And there's even a group called degrowth or a, a growth society in which we have to learn to live at much lower levels 
of consumption. Um, this all has led to inappropriate production and consumption patterns. And aside from the limitations of perfectly working markets, we have increasingly failed to engage individuals in the society to realize their human potential. If 30% uh, of our industrial plant goes unutilized, we, we are crying, well, look, we're wasting our resources, but we seem to be content to waste as much as 70% of human resources by not engaging them in the society in a productive capacity. And then something which a few years ago I might not have had on my slide when talking about fully industrialized system because the assumption was corruption was a third world problem. But we realize that corruption is actually, well, doing very well at home, thank you. And it's not just a question of putting your finger into the till. It's a question of not meeting both social and private sector responsibilities. The corporation, the modern business corporation, is a, fig is a construct of law. And the argument for giving corporations limited liability and low tax rates was they did two things for the society. They um, endowed us with a variety of goods and services, which was not possible, for example, under socialist economies. And they also created jobs. But the quid pro quo, the creation of jobs, seems to have been forgotten in the grand scheme of things because corporations find it to their interest to relocate. Uh, and so the jobs and corporate welfare have not been uh, an even quid pro quo. We have a high throughput industrial system. <coughs> we in the United States, for example, use more resources per capita and energy than any other nation. And it converts materials and energy into products and services, which now are beyond our capacity to purchase. And then finally, an addiction to growth. Um, <coughs> A dominance of GDP, gross domestic product, and productivity as metrics of economic health. Uh, forgetting, for example, that you can have a growth in GDP without it benefiting the society. If we have increased hurricanes and snow removal, it increases the GDP, but it does not benefit the society. And productivity, which is defined as the labor productivity, Output over labor hour input or labor dollar input is another one of these metrics that I'll come back to, which is a misfit with regard to measuring economic health and the welfare of a nation. And then finally, for years, a failure to deal with employment as a fundamental issue and challenge, which has now come home to haunt us since jobs seem to be the most often discussed issue along with financial collapse. So those are the major systemic problems that we have. And in this slide, it's simply it's a representation that the three major legs of sustainable development, the economy, the environment, health and safety, and work are all connected. What occurs in one corner of the triangle affects things in the other corner of the triangle. I'll come back to this. And both the corners of the triangle and the relationship between the economy, environment, and work are affected by both technological change and innovation and by globalization. Both of those forces work to influence the relationship, albeit in different ways. Now, we live in a globalized world, one in which trade becomes essentially increasingly important as a source of revenue. And globalization means a number of different things. First of all, what we produce and what we sell is now global. That knowledge and information is universally accessible. That money can travel in an instant between markets and between buyers and sellers. And in fact, it moves so quick that much investment is tied up in currency speculation and not in the traditional areas of venture capital where research and development develop both economic health and jobs. 
and it's been suggested by the former Nobel Prize winner, James Tobin, that we assess a tax to the transaction, financial transactions to slow the machine down, which is basically money chasing money, not engaged in productive activities. And then finally, the issue of labor mobility, <clears throat> both the importation of good brains into industrial systems and the reverse side of the coin, the pressures of immigration of people wanting to move from one area to another because they cannot make it in the economy in which they sit. And uh, these globalized trends have an enormous impact on what is produced where and what kinds of investments we make. Returning to the triangle, which is these three corners that we talked about, now is to, to talk a little bit about the relationship between what goes on in the economy and what goes on environmentally and job-wise. The first thing we see, of course, is the repetition at the top of the triangle of the four major kinds of environmental challenges, noting that the economy is related to those problems through, through three different activities. One is just industrialization. The more you produce and the more energy you use and the more materials you convert, the more the environment is affected. Secondly, the more investment that you make, either domestically or globally, the more industrialization is affected. And finally, the more trade that you do, the more both investment and development is affected. So through these three really somewhat independent forces, we find that there is a relationship between what goes on in the economy and what happens to the environment. The economic activities are improvements in competitiveness and productiveness and the use of physical, natural, and human capital, improving the industrial working of the state. The economic changes that result from labor replacement or displacement and capital relocation to other areas. And finally, the kind of financing which finances growth and development. And they work by changing what's called the international division of labor, changing what is made where, and changing the nature of work, the automation of workplaces, the automation of the um, service industry, which affects some very important features of employment. The skills that are used and needed, wages, purchasing power, job security, health and safety, job satisfaction, and the number of jobs both wages and the number of jobs is receiving prime attention at this point. And the argument is, well, you've got then concerns about environment at the top of the triangle, concerns about employment. If you decide that really the issue that you need to address is employment, you've got to get people working at least right away, temporarily through turnkey projects. We realize that if you do that, Fixing potholes and painting bridges and increasing industrial activities will increase the environmental footprint. So we are going to sacrifice some environmental quality in order to get people working. On the other hand, people have argued that we're going to get green jobs out of the environment, that environmental and energy improvements will create or change the nature of employment. And this is probably one of the biggest promises that cannot be met under the current way of doing things. We will create green jobs, but we will destroy brown jobs. And at the end of the day, whether you're talking about global climate change or toxic pollution, it turns out it's pretty much of a wash. Because whenever we modernize industrial plant, industry takes the opportunity to shed labor. We automate and we replace labor. And the real wages in the United States have gone down about 20% in the last 20 years and continue to go down. People who get jobs, who have been unemployed, get jobs at a fraction of the wage that they used to have. Now, we need to regulate toxic pollution and climate change causation. And people have argued, well, that's going to have an effect. Going to have an effect on, I'm stuck here. Let's see. Hold on. Sorry, everybody. Because the regulation of health, safety, and environment will affect the economy and growth. The typical conservative perspective is regulation hurts jobs and growth. 
the work done at MIT and by Mr. Porter at the Harvard Business Show that regulation properly designed actually creates jobs through the stimulation of new technology. And we'll come back to what's called the Porter Hypothesis and the work done at MIT. But this trial now, which taken some time to explain, has really shown the interrelationship between the economy, environment, and work, and should convince you you cannot work at one end of the triangle without really doing uh, an accounting for what's happening in other parts of the triangle. Now let me say a little bit about why work is so important. There are the typical economic reasons, which is that it's what is combined with natural and physical capital to produce goods and services. You will always need a certain amount of workers to produce the products of the industrial state. It's the place where labor and management exchange their relative comparative advantages. It is the means by which we distribute wealth and create purchasing power, which at the moment is in crisis. We don't have enough of the consumer demand, even though we have the capacity to produce more goods and services. Aside from the economic analysis of why work is important, which should not be new to anybody listening, are the social consequences of why work is important. It is the means of engagement in the society. People who are not working have difficult home lives, marriages break up, spousal violence increases when people are not working and engaged and feel that they have a purpose. It is the mechanism by which we enhance self-esteem. If you meet somebody from some other country or place, Besides their name and where they're from, the third question you ask is, what do you do? What do you do for a living? And of course, there's work which is not monetized, like taking care of children and parents, which is extremely valuable, but which does not show up in the GDP statistics. Finally, industrial and economic policy, environmental policy, trade policy, all of these policies have important consequences for employment. We see this now with the, with the attention towards China in terms of an undervalued currency, which of course advantages the location of production facilities out of the United States. I join with other people who believe that manufacturing can be brought back to the United States. When you think about it, it makes absolutely no sense to send steel to China and to bring back refrigerators. I mean, if you would say that's what I'm going to do, say 20 years ago, they'd say, you're crazy. But that's because energy is underpriced and we don't pay the full costs of that particular activity. So work is important for a variety of reasons. Now, labor productivity is a ratio. It is defined as output or the cost of outputs per unit of the cost of labor. So it is the number of goods produced per labor hour or per labor salary. Now, that says nothing about how you improve productivity, but nations with high labor productivity are regarded as desirable or sectors of the industry. But how do we improve labor productivity? Well, you could increase worker skills without changing technology or anything else. What you're doing in increasing labor skills is improving labor productiveness as well as labor productivity the productiveness of labor increases and the labor content and the rewards to workers are increased. In industries where labor is highly valued, you find salaries going up higher than the inflation rate. On the other hand, you could develop better hardware, software, better manufacturing systems, automate the systems. You're increasing the productiveness, not of labor, but you're increasing capital productiveness. As a statistical artifact, you happen to improve labor productivity because it's only a ratio. You increase the productivity that you have divided by the number of labor hours, even though labor isn't doing most of the work. So you improve capital productiveness by basically shedding labor, and that's where the major source of labor productivity has to come in the United States. Well, labor cannot claim uh, the kind of salaries that it did since machines are doing most of the work. And so labor productiveness goes, uh, even though it, it stays the same, 
capital productiveness increases, salaries go down, and by the way, demand on the part of consumers goes down. So rather than looking for domestic consumption to satisfy the productivity improvements, we now are pressed to sell our products abroad and to, to, to the emerging middle class that can afford it. There's one more way that you improve labor productivity, and that is to externalize the cost of manufacturing onto the consumer. You must have noticed that if you assemble your own bookcase that you buy from IKEA, you're doing the work. The bookcase may be cheaper than one that was assembled, but your time is regarded as nothing. And how many hours do you spend on tech support and getting your, your ticket from a travel uh, source? Your, all the time is now basically externalized. So yes, it's called Gresham's Law of Externalities. If industry and the service industry can externalize the cost of productiveness onto the consumer, it looks as if you're getting a cheaper product, but you're not. So all of the preoccupation which improving labor productivity through the three bottom entries on this slide are all done at the expense of the consumer and the expense of labor. That is where we have gone in terms of the industrial state. Well, we've talked about the problems. What are the solutions? Well, we need to have a transformation through four different kinds of innovation. One is technological innovation, by the way, which is not the most difficult or burden barrier that we have. There are a lot of technologies which could be applied which are not. We need organizational innovation, which is the way the firm is organized. We need institutional innovation, which means we need the proper laws and the government institutions to implement those laws. And we need societal and social innovation to rethink what, how they are satisfying their human needs, whether it's through energy or consumption of physical resources. All these transformations have to occur if we're going to find ourselves in a better place. Now, I've indicated to you that jobs are the crucial pressure point at this point. How can we improve uh, the earning capacity and purchasing power and improve livelihoods? And there are a number of ways that this can be done. We can just transfer money from the rich to the poor. Well, I'll, let you, I'll leave you with that. You can decide whether that is something that's going to be high on anybody's uh, list. We could argue that we need more Keynesian spending, which Paul Krugman has argued, to jumpstart the economy. These will create jobs with regard to improving infrastructure, painting bridges, fixing the potholes. It'll probably take about a year between the money that has to be invested to start these jobs and the actual job. So it's not going to happen right away. And it has very little to do with what the equilibrium situation is with regard to creating jobs on a long-term basis. We could try to spread out the existing work. And France experimented with a shorter work week. Wasn't very successful. And there are people who are in what are called the new economics that argue that people who are working ought to work less, so others who are not working can work more. That's an income transfer within the workplace. That's not an income transfer from producers to workers or from the taxpayer to the workers. It's nice if you can get it, and it would certainly yield some pressure reduction, but it's not going to solve the basic problem that work has been designed out of the economic system. You could prohibit the elimination of jobs, which is the German regulatory situation. Germany is very interesting. While we had a less than a percent growth in our economy, Germany had a 9% growth. Because when the workers were not fired, because you couldn't eliminate the jobs, when demand increased again, both domestically and foreign, the workers were right there to pick up the demands on inventory increase. It takes you only a few months or a couple of years to go into a depression and a recession. It takes you 10 years to grow out of it. Creating jobs which you have destroyed takes an enormous amount of time. And Germany is an interesting case 
that did not allow that as a result of not being able to fire workers easily. We could increase labor's claim on profits from production services by designing work back into production and services, reverse the trend of automation. And we at MIT and in the European engineering schools know how to design work out of production. Do we know how to design work back in? That's a skill that used to be called sociotechnique, which needs to be relearned. We could learn to meet our essential needs in a different way by sharing, for example, cars, uh, by having uh, Xerox, which they do lease reproduction services. But there's a limit to how much that can do. We can change the way money is spent, not only by meeting essential, disease, uh, essential needs in a different way, by spending money not on stuff, but on people. Rather than buying your kid another Nintendo game, you might consider giving him Chinese lessons which would employ a person which has a large leveraging effect on the economy. But all the forces in the society move towards decreasing labor, not increasing the role of people in the economy. And there's a reason for that. The corporations don't own people. They own machines. You could change workers into the owners. My brother Robert Ashford has talked about two-factor economics, making workers into owners, and not just through um, stock ownership plans, but allowing them to have part of the capital investment privileges. At this time, when we don't have a lot of capital investment, it seems that this will not yield an immediate recovery. But these are the options you have, and the government has, in terms of increasing earning capacity and sustainable livelihoods. Now, government is essential. And you know the list, a supporter of basic education and skills, a provider of physical and legal, and legal infrastructure, investing in the science and technology that the private sector will not invest in, as a facilitator or arbitrator of competing interests, so that the process of readjustment is fair, becoming a trustee of worker and citizen interests, as well as the trustee of new technology against the incumbents that do not want to change. And as a force to integrate, not just coordinate policies. And you need to have this word that was considered to be off the table before. You need the regulation of finance, antitrust, safety, health, environment, labor markets, and trade. There is no substitute for creating the targets of a transformation and which require legal responses. A free-for-all and a deregulatory history, both in banking and in manufacturing, has been responsible for getting us into the mess that we are in. And yet, we don't seem to be able to really get the regulation requirements back on track. In fact, Obama <coughs> basically retreated from ozone regulation. People are arguing that regulation costs jobs even though the data show otherwise. Now here is a slide which really shows how regulation can improve the technological responses, uh, which is the third column. You can just have end of pipe control for toxic materials, which doesn't get you much more than an end of pipe device. But serious stringent regulation can require new products, product services, or processes, which the regulated firm actually may not be able to give you. It may be new products and product services by new producers and providers. <coughs> An example is Monsanto Chemical Company made the traditional PCBs, which fill transformers and capacitors, but it took Dow Silicone, an entirely different corporation, to come in with a much better dielectric fluid. Regulation shifts the nature of production and encourages new entrants, whether it's the financial industry or it's the manufacturing industry. And Mr. Porter at the business schools talked about the Porter hypothesis, which shows that people who respond to regulation save money by resource 
saving and by new efficient production methods. And that occurred some 15 years later than the work that was pioneered at MIT, where we showed not only does the incumbent industry stand a chance of doing better, but you can actually restructure industry by having stringent regulation. And this is an, an area which deserves a great deal of attention. Now the academic or the policy analysts will ask three questions. <clears throat> what are the causes of unsustainable industrial systems? I hope I too have imparted for you what those causes are. Then what are the visions for a sustainable future? And you have to reopen or open the design space, <coughs> the problem space to achieve multiple goals. You've got to design energy and manufacturing and labor market policy and trade policy together. And you have to fix the carrots and the sticks so that makes sense. Now, you might think that these are the only three questions. What are the causes of a problem? How do you get it? What, do you, what does a sustainable system look like? And what carrots and sticks should you use? But there is a missing question, and it's a political question. Who or what is standing in your way of achieving that future? So you not only have to open up the problem space, you have to open up the participatory and political space. Because if Enron dictates the energy policy, if the petroleum industry dictates the energy, the energy policy, you will not have new technologies. The incumbent industries gain and gain from the system and do not want to change. So solutions will require opening up the problem space, which is, by the way, an observation made by Tom Allen of the Sloan School years and years ago. People have to look at the problems together and design joint solution. You have to open up participatory and political space so that the multiple voices are heard. And you need not a bigger government, but a stronger and integrated government to look at these issues together. If you look at what government does, they do a variety of these activities, and they address environmental problems, economic problems, and social development issues. It's done through a number of different departments in our federal government, from the Department of Energy to the Environmental Protection Agency, but it is fragmented. <clears throat> These things need to be integrated. You need to have a vision, which you are not trading off jobs for environment, but you are working together to have mutual gains in the system. And that is what is, has to be needed. Let me see. I don't seem to. I'm stuck here. Let's see. Take home lessons. Thank you. OK. What are the take home lessons? Everything is connected to everything else. There are many more ways to address the problems incorrectly than correctly. We can point to government failures. And in fact, it's very interesting that point to this energy firm, which everybody is arguing you know, was a giveaway, an incorrect choice. You, you don't look at one example of success or failure. You look at a portfolio. Because if you want to have high benefit industrial activity, you've got to take some industrial risks. And that means that some of your choices fail. So you have many more ways to do it wrong than to do it right. You need mutually supportive goals, what I call co-optimization. It's not a question of balance. It's a question of mutual gain. And you need government intervention to counter, lock in, and capture. And you need a national sustainability initiative for the economy. Many of you may know this painting by Magritte. It says, this is not a pipe. No, it's a picture of a pipe. That was his comment. Well, here's the book we produced. Yes, it is a textbook, but it is not just a textbook. It is a formulation based on the work of many other people <clears throat> took 10 years in the making of how we need to address the economy, the environment, health, and safety, and the jobs. It is a thoughtful compilation of hundreds of books and people's thinking. And we believe that we have some of the answers to this problem. So let me stop here. I think I've taken exactly 45 minutes. And we can open up to any questions that you might have.
Okay. So great. Um, if anybody has any questions for Professor Ashford, please feel free to enter them in the chat window. Uh, be sure to address them to everyone. Uh, our first question comes from Ted, who asks, what is the role of experimentation in working out the role of possible solutions? Or do we have to get it right the first time? Very important question. Experimentation is absolutely crucial. Demonstration projects, experimentation. I'm reminded, by the way, of a question that was asked of Thomas Edison. They said, you have a lot of patents, but very few commercial successes. How do you feel about your failures? And he said, failures? I never had any failures. I learned from everything I ever did. So, I mean, I think that says it all. We need to experiment. We need to sometimes experiment on a regional basis or on a sectoral basis. You know, may a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, we need, there isn't one way to do things. Experimentation is absolutely crucial. Thank you for that question. Okay, again, uh, feel free to use the chat window to ask questions of Prof Professor Ashford. Uh, the chat window can be found um, at the top of your window. There should be a, a little drop down. Um, you can open the chat window. I'd like to ask a question. Can you um, share some thoughts on the role of the media in creating these new options? Well, you know, the media are extraordinarily important. And um, giving equal space to unequally meritorious ideas is a real disservice. I mean, it isn't a question of on one hand, but on the other hand, and you give equal space to nonsense. Uh, the media has not has not exercised an editorial function, which is to separate the good ideas from the nonsense. It also promotes ideas and political uh, pundits who really, uh, really do not deserve the space that they get. The media are also um, very subject to the very economic forces through advertising. And I'm sure there are many views that I presented in this talk today which would not fit prime, prime time funding. Uh, the realities are we are in a very serious state of affairs that the present incumbent industries game the system and gain from the system and want to continue the past. The truth of the matter is we can never return to where we were because the growth and the benefits of that system were an illusion. I think it's pretty clear from the 2008 meltdown, that we were living in a bubble, both mentally and physically. Thank you. Our next question comes from Joseph Azzarelli, who asks, what types of organizational innovations are envisioned as being more sustainable alternatives to what already exists? Well, thanks for that question. The, just as I indicated that the fragmentation of the knowledge base has permeated not only government and education, but the industrial firm. Separating production from environmental concerns, from labor market concerns, from uh, human resources, this balkanization means that you do not look at simultaneously improving products and employment options. You basically concentrate on one thing. The industrial firm needs to be much more Integrated. There used to be a concept called matrix management where you attempted to integrate the various aspects of management functions. But we need to view the, the, the activities in the industrial firm holistically. And that means health and safety. That means product safety. Um, the organizational balkanization of the industrial firm disserves the long-term interests of the industrial firm. Great. Uh, another question from Ted who asks, do you see more progress in some industry, industries versus others? How do we use those in the forefront to help other industries make advances? Well, some industries are more at the forefront by virtue of the fact that they're much more technologically flexible. I mean, one could argue that certain aspects of the high-tech industry have not become rigidified, and therefore management may be more receptive to new ideas. I mean, one of the greatest uh, review barriers to innovation in the firm 
is the fact that they don't want changes that changes what they do. They don't have direct access to outsiders. I mean, you've got to bring outside views and, 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 and people and ideas into the firm and encourage basically changes from within the firm. The, the, I mean, it's recognized, for example, in Europe that the greatest drag on European productivity is a lack of organizational innovation. And where we have had increases in employment in the United States, it has been the result of looking at organizational change. Uh, Adam Wolf asks, service industries such as healthcare seem to be a significant part of the solution as their employment is difficult to relocate. Can you comment on the role of healthcare and the access to healthcare in relation to sustainable development? Well, of course, I mean, there are two different kinds of healthcare. One would be preventative and one would be basically palliative. I mean, the fact that we have disease and, and a lot of anthropogenic disease is, a, is, a, is an index of the failure of the industrial system to prevent, let's say, asbestos-caused disease or stress on the job or what have you. Um, Health care ought to be directed much more towards prevention. Uh, it is not. The, obviously, the health care system in this country thrives on the fact that an awful lot of activity is tied up in the management of health care rather than the delivery of uh, preventative. So I would say, of course, as the population becomes older, there will be more and more health services that are needed, care of the elderly. This is unavoidable. But there are ways to care and there are ways to care. And I, I mean, the health care system is dramatically in need of uh, restructuring, as everyone knows. Uh, our next question is, how would you suggest developing a knowledgeable citizenry? Well, that requires a, a number of things. First of all, we need desperately to improve the school, K through 12 school. People don't know how to balance a check. They don't understand how the economy works. They don't understand how government works. I have to tell you, the two most important classes I ever had in my life were in high school. One was on civics, which probably isn't taught anymore, and the other was on propaganda. And I think between the two, you know, it begins to sensitize you to what you need. We need to educate people so that they are capable of critical thinking. The lack of critical thinking in the society is enormous. It comes, correcting it at the university level comes very, very late. The fact that we believe in a lot of nonsense uh, and cannot separate the truth from, uh, from fiction means that the society is, is really ill-informed. The media does its own share of misinforming, and we, need, but the, we really need to look closely at the media in terms of the kind of, of misinformation that continues to get permeated. Uh, great. Uh, our next question is, is the rate of change or incentive to improve of incumbents increased due to the information technology or rate of technological developments or public awareness, say, from 20 or 30 years ago? Well, ICT technology is an enabling technology. It allows you to do things faster. You can do accounting faster. You can do input-out analysis. But if fundamentally what you're producing hasn't changed, but simply you're enabling you to do it faster, this is not the kind of innovation that leads, in the Schumpeterian sense, to products being replaced by other products, to incumbent firms being turned over. I mean, Schumpeter talked about the waves of creative destruction. You need to have turnover that the belief in the networked learning um, morphing corporation is a, I think, is tremendously overblown. In organizational theory in the business schools, you talk about changing the corporation. Very few people learn about replacing or displacing the corporations. Dinosaurs don't fly, and you need constant replacement. And if you allow the incumbents to game the system, you will get incremental change. <laughs> 
Uh, our next question comes from Dr. Nazrul Islam, who asks, technological education remains core to the global sustainable development. Could you please comment on citizenship restrictions in most of the universities in the USA, UK, and EU, and others with regard to entry and securing scholarships at higher level education? What is your comment on such contradictions, especially in the field of biomedical and public health, considering my area of interest? I'm not sure I completely comprehend the, the question. Um, so one thing, uh, and maybe you're, maybe you're talking about this, the, let me put it this way. The access of higher education to the better institutions is not adequate for people at the low socioeconomic rate, rank. I don't think we teach citizenship in the high schools, grammar schools, or university. I mean, uh, corporate social responsibility, from my perspective, as practice, is an oxymoron. I mean, there is no coming to grips with the fact that sometimes what a corporation produces and the services that it renders and really have a tremendous anti-social value. But what determines survival in the marketplace are markets, promotion, advertising, and a lack of citizen education as to what kinds of products and what kinds of services satisfy their real interests is totally lacking. I mean, there's an interest in selling, but whether the sale is good or bad is a different issue. Uh, great. Our uh, next question comes from Susan Anderson, who asks, how would you suggest developing a longer range view of costs and benefits in our political system and in our industrial systems? Well, I think you've got to educate people more interdisciplinarily. I think that that producing people who are only educated in one dimension means that to a person whose only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's the balkanization and the specialization of education, in my view, has outlived its usefulness. We need more transdisciplinary research. We need to encourage in the university people who are transdisciplinary. We give lip service to this. We do not really do it. I think, um, you know, I think the educational challenge is enormous, absolutely enormous. Uh, Ralph Hall uh, says 90,000 jobs are destroyed each day in the U.S. and approximately this number are created. 250,000 people change jobs each day in the U.S. Hence, the employment market is dynamic. We have an opportunity to focus on the creation of the new 90,000 jobs towards more sustainable forms of employment. How to do this will be one of the major future challenges. What could institutions like MIT uh, do to reintegrate the concern for employment into its educational and research programs? Well, that's a, that's a really crucial question. I think we need to, 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 to bring together both the social scientists and the engineers and material scientists to find a way to design labor and work back into production and services. I mean, the trend which is to replace labor, to displace labor, to make labor less valuable, of course, you know, is pursued because the owners of capital own and they gain from the rent of physical artifacts. The, the, the you know, the, the question of making industry more labor intensive is something which requires concerted effort on the part of both social scientists and physical scientists. <clears throat> Um, great. Uh, we've got a question from Amir Fali, who asks, what is the key behind more rapid corporate displacement process? Regulation. <clears throat> if you want to, if you believe that a product which is on the market is not a good product, one ought to regulate that product. It creates the opportunity for market penetration. We have countless numbers of examples from, from the work done, by the way, at MIT where stringent regulation has forced a displacement of the industry. You know, if industry is not capable of meeting the new challenges, then they need to be moved out of the way. Because our industrial growth and health depends on more profitable and environmentally sound technology. Green jobs may not be created by new industry, but a green environment can be created by green industry. 
Well, thank you everybody for your participation today. Professor Ashford, thank you. This has been a wonderful session. For uh, those of you who are interested, we will have a recorded version of this presentation on the SDM website. We'll be sending out um, a notice of that later this week. And our next webinar will be on October 30th. Uh, delivered by Mark Moran of John Deere, who will be discussing the overall topic of how to help um, an, an established company think and work in new ways. Thank you again for joining us, and have a great day.